Hello, and welcome to the Year of the Nurse event, Bridging Nursing Research and Innovation. My name is Carol Musel, and I'm the Dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Shannon Zenk, the new director of the National Institute of Nursing Research. Dr. Zenk is a registered nurse and a leading nurse researcher. Her research focuses on social inequities in health with a goal of identifying effective, multi-level approaches to improve health and to eliminate racial and ethnic and socioeconomic health disparities. Her research portfolio includes work into urban food environments, community health solutions, and veterans' health. As director of NINR, Dr. Zank oversees the Institute's research and training programs in support of NINR's mission to improve the lives of individuals and families living with illness, to develop personalized strategies to maximize health and well being at all stages of life, across diverse populations and settings, and to support training and career development to foster the next generation of nurse scientists. As a nurse researcher and scientist, I'm excited to hear what the future holds at NINR and how we as nurses can help to advance nursing science and research. Thank you, Dr. Zank, for being with us today. Welcome. Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak today. It's truly an honor to lead NINR into the next phase of its history. I'm just beginning my third month as NINR director. And while I know some of you, I look forward to having a chance to meet all of you in the coming months. For those who don't know me, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself and my love of science. Then I'll talk about some of the innovative work supported by NINR and end with a brief discussion of how we're looking into the future. My background is in nursing and public health. My pre-doctoral training at the University of Michigan was in psychosocial factors and mental health and illness, and my postdoctoral training in cancer control and population science. For the past 14 years, I pursued research, teaching, and service as a faculty member at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing. My program of research at UIC focused on social inequities in health, with the goal of identifying effective multi-level approaches to improve health and eliminate racial and socioeconomic health inequities. Much of my work was on community environments, particularly the food environment and energy balance related behaviors and health conditions. Several experiences led to my interest in community environments. Early in my career as a home health nurse case manager, I was struck by the tremendous differences in the home and community environments of patients in my caseload. The stark contrast of patients' living conditions, both in terms of privilege and poverty, and the impact those living conditions had on their health was really striking to me. As a PhD student, I worked as a research assistant on studies in Detroit, Michigan, listening to residents describe the lack of healthy foods in their communities and the abundance of unhealthy options got me interested in food access specifically. These experiences as a home health nurse and in my studies played a big role in shaping my research trajectory. My colleagues and I conducted some of the pioneering research on food deserts in the United States, which increased attention to the problem of inadequate access to healthy foods in low-income and Black communities. We've since produced evidence on the implications of these social inequities for dietary behaviors and related health conditions. Over the years, we've developed new approaches to improve measurement of community environments and environmental exposures. For example, we were early adopters of GPS tracking to study broader activity space environments beyond where people lived in relation to energy balance behaviors. Our recent work combines sensors with other real-time data collection approaches to identify how environmental and personal factors interact to influence behaviors. Now that I'm at NIH, I'm glad I'll have the chance to continue my research through the intramural program at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. From my prior work, I see three key experiences that are bound to influence my role as NINR director. Through my many collaborations with scientists um, across multiple fields, I've gained a breadth of experience in and appreciation for different types of scientific approaches. This includes community-based participatory research, research using big data, qualitative research, and evaluation of policy interventions. 
Mentoring future scientists has been a valued part of my career, and I've learned much about promoting scientific excellence through my peer review service and leadership. I immensely enjoyed conducting research on issues and populations that I care about and with colleagues from whom I've learned so much. And I enjoyed being a nursing faculty member. But when I began having conversations about the NINR director position, learning more, and thinking about NINR scientific possibilities, my excitement grew and I became really interested in contributing to research in a different way. As we move forward, NINR has a strong legacy of accomplishments to build on. Some of the nurse scientists in this event have played an important role in these achievements. NINR extramural and intramural researchers have advanced science in a number of key areas and helped train countless nurses, including myself through a K award to conduct rigorous research, including in emerging scientific areas and methodologies. For those of you who aren't as familiar with our work at NINR, we're currently uh, focused on several broad research areas, advancing our understanding and management of symptoms, promoting wellness, developing new strategies for self-managing chronic illness, enhancing end of life and palliative care for those with advanced illness. Across all of these areas, we support research on new technologies, as well as training programs to help de develop the next generation of nursing scientists. At the end of my presentation today, I'll share a few minutes, I'll spend a few minutes talking about our next strategic plan. In keeping with the theme of today's meeting, I thought I'd share with you some of the innovative research that we support that makes use of technology for many different purposes, from disease management to patient care to clinical decision-making. A prototype device for asthma symptom monitoring developed with NINR funding is now being tested for possible use in monitoring patients with COVID-19. Conceptualized by, by a nurse scientist and now patented and licensed by that grantee to a digital health company, the device can be worn as a flexible patch with a rechargeable battery anywhere on the upper torso. Known as the automated device for asthma monitoring and management, it can monitor respiratory conditions and symptoms, such as coughing frequency, providing essential information to patients and healthcare providers for managing their illness and care. It can also monitor other respiratory conditions as well. This device has been cited as one of the top wearable technologies in 2020 by an industry publication. In the area of M Health innovation, NINR supported researchers developed and tested a wireless M Health sensing device to measure stress using human sweat as an alternative to current methods such as questionnaires or invasive blood tests. Initial testing of the device revealed a relationship between levels of blood measured cortisol and sweat measured cortisol. Preliminary findings suggest that this device could serve as a reliable, non-invasive, fast, real-time method to measure sweat for use in research as well as in personalized healthcare. An NINR Phase One Small Business Award supported the development of a clear front face mask to improve communication in clinical settings. The mask, known as face view mask, could be especially useful for patients or providers who are deaf or hard of hearing. It's also being tested with pediatric dental patients who may feel more comfortable being able to see a provider's facial expressions. The team, led by Jian Han, is now in the process of moving their invention toward commercialization. Technology can also facilitate decision support, self-management, and access to healthcare. The Discharge Decision Support System, D2S2 tool, which was developed by Dr. Catherine Bowles of University of Pennsylvania and her colleagues, is embedded in EHR systems to identify patients in need of follow-up after hospital discharge. Large-scale testing, three hospitals, thousands of patients of D2S2 yielded significant reduction of hospital readmissions and garnered venture capital funding. Dr. Bowles and her team also conducted a randomized control trial of the Discharge Referral Expert System for Care Transitions Algorithm, or DIRECT, compared with usual care without decision support. DIRECT uses EHR data for clinical decision support for referrals of acute care to post-acute care. 
they found lower hospital readmission rates with direct clinical decision support. They found no significant difference between the proportion of post-acute care referrals from direct clinical decision support and usual care. Hence, direct clinical decision support could alleviate care provider workload. The Advanced Visualization Branch in the NINR Intramural Program, led by Dr. Patty Brennan, develops and evaluates augmented and virtual reality experiences to engage the participant in multi-sensory experiences and examines their impact on health behavior. These simulations enable patients with self-management goals to rehearse problem-solving behaviors, to foster improved health outcomes within home-based care environments and live independently. One example of their current work is designing a virtual supermarket to help patients learn or relearn how to navigate a grocery store. These are only a few examples of the research we've supported at NINR in recent years. But we're also focused on the future and positioning ourselves and the investigators we support for success. We in nursing science must respond to the current and impending health landscape. We must be bold in our thinking and innovative in our approach. We need to be ready for new directions and to take risks. As we scan the current health and healthcare landscape, it's clear we have much work to do. More than ever, we see the need for more and better knowledge, technology, healthcare, and public health services to improve the nation's health. We face pressing challenges affecting the public's health and persistent large health inequities for which we have an incomplete understanding and inadequate solutions. In the current landscape, racial and social injustices have gained broader recognition, including their wide reaching health effects. Public demand is high for deep and lasting change so that everyone has a chance to live a long and healthy life. Nursing practice and policy solutions are urgently needed in this landscape. COVID-19, for example, has illustrated that improving the public, public's health and eliminating inequities will require extending nursing science upstream to incorporate social determinants of health. The hallmark of nursing is our holistic perspective. Nurses have long appreciated that supporting people in, to improve their health and restore their health means addressing factors at multiple levels, physical, emotional, social, and economic, and creating favorable conditions, systems, and environments. This holistic perspective ideally positions nursing science to bridge biomedical and community research, biological and social determinants, and practice and policy solutions. Our responsibility is to increase our impact in solving the most pressing health problems and the most stubborn health inequities by collaboratively taking nursing science to new levels. One direction is to draw on our holistic perspective and push the scientific boundaries of multi-level integration from the molecular to the macro. Science on multi-level integration includes studying how factors at multiple levels interact to affect health and testing multi-level interventions. These levels can extend from molecules at the biological level up to social determinants and macro level factors. To maximize the impact of our scientific discoveries, it will be important for us to prioritize translation in our science. Prioritizing translation might mean focusing on practice and policy relevant questions from the start and advancing the science of translation, which identifies how to effectively move scientific breakthroughs into practice and policy change. There's much to consider, such as where can we in nursing science have the biggest impact? What are the key scientific opportunities and in multi-level integration? Given that advancing health equity is a top priority for M NINR, how can we eliminate systematic health gaps? And are there particular inequities that we should focus on? What are the key scientific gaps in translating our discoveries into practice and policy? What kinds of training do we need to propel scientific integration of upstream and downstream factors and their translation? Strategic planning at NINR fortuitously coincides with this pivotal time for nursing science. NINR's current strategic plan is set to expire in late 2021 and will release a new plan shortly thereafter. 
This will be a major focus at NINR over the next year, and we're all really excited to see where the planning process takes us. There are several key principles that will guide this process. Think boldly, think differently. Think about the end at the beginning or plan for translation. Demonstrate impact, embrace change and opportunity, be role models to the next generation. We certainly hope that everyone will be interested in contributing to the new strategic plan. I can't emphasize that last point enough. At every stage of the process, we want to make sure the nursing community is involved. We want your feedback and we want your ideas. Here's some of what we've already started and what we're planning for the next year. NINR recently conducted a feedback campaign. Tell us what nursing research means to you. We formed a strategic plan working group under our National Advisory Council. We're planning webinars and workshops on scientific topics. There will be multiple opportunities for public comment. And we're currently developing a dedicated section on our website for the strategic planning process. For the feedback campaign that concluded in August on what nursing research means to you, we received over 380 responses. We've done an initial scan of the responses and a few themes have emerged as shown on the slide. We thank everyone who took the time to contribute. These are just some of the data that will feed into the strategic planning process. As I mentioned, we recently introduced a section on our website that will be updated regularly with new information about the strategic planning process. The content's a little sparse at this time, but please check back frequently. Importantly, there's a dedicated email address on that site, which is also shown here on the slide for feedback. Please feel free to send us your thoughts to that address at any time. So thank you again for the chance to speak with you today. I look forward to many conversations in the months and years to come and to working together to advance groundbreaking nursing science and its impact. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Zink, for your keynote remarks. And we look forward to witnessing the impact of your leadership on nursing research and innovation. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ronald Hickman, the Ruth M. Anderson Endowed Chair and Associate Dean for Research at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing at Case Western Reserve University. Every day, nurses are leading research and creating innovations to improve healthcare. Nurses are well positioned to lead innovation by creating research-driven, innovative products and transformative process changes. Take, for instance, the crash cart. Anita Dorr, an emergency room nurse, knows that it took nurses too long to find medications and the equipment needed to treat these seriously ill patients. As a result of her observations, she created a prototype crash cart in her basement. Now, crash carts are just one example of the many nursing innovations that have transformed healthcare delivery and quality in the US and worldwide. For the next few moments, we're gonna see a few local nurse innovators who have developed innovative products or transformative processes that are improving care and the quality of care locally. Know if neighborhood influences the relationship between transitional care and risk for hospital readmission in older adults with heart failure. I found that a provider visit soon after discharge decreased the odds of readmission and nursing care coordination increased the odds of having a provider visit for all patients except for those living in the poorest neighborhoods. New research is needed to address this gap in transition related care. Beta Scout is a clinical tool that was developed at Cleveland Clinic it's an enhanced early warning system designed to support the recognition and intervention for early signs of clinical deterioration. Using innovative technology, it provides real-time color-coded visual alerts, prompting the nurse to evaluate the significance of the change for that specific patient. Additional tools include a report with key data shared by all caregivers, timers indicating when new vital signs are due, 
documentation templates, and a screensaver with color-coded tiles for all patients on that unit, promoting uh, situational awareness. and I'm the Advanced Practice Education Coordinator at Akron Children's Hospital. When the COVID-19 pandemic forced the closure of in-person conferences, our Advanced Practice Provider Pharmacology Conference Planning Committee recognized an opportunity to deliver education in an innovative new way. We collaborated with our media relations team and our medical education team to design a method for registration, content delivery, and evaluation that allowed us to deliver six hours of pediatric pharmacology and one hour of Category A Ohio Nursing Law to over 360 participants on demand, not only in Ohio, but throughout the entire United States. Hi, my name is Heather Condo DiCiaccio. I am a nursing professional development specialist out of Cleveland Clinic Hillcrest Hospital. My focus is that postpartum world, and I take care of the nurses who take care of the families from two hours after birth until they go home. We had a request several years ago from many families to delay the bath, and we couldn't understand why. So we dug into the literature. We could not find a good answer, so we decided to create the answer. Through our study, we found that delaying that bath at least 12 hours could have a positive effect on exclusive breastfeeding rates in the postpartum period. My name is Debbie Klein, and I am here to share with you my innovation, the nonverbal pain assessment tool. This tool was developed here at the Cleveland Clinic with a team of nurses to assess pain in patients who are unable to assess pain. The resulting tool is now a valid, reliable tool used across the Cleveland Health System starting in 2010 and is still in use today. The tool is also used in other hospitals across the United States and has been translated into Chinese. I'm Nancy Delney, a rheumatology pediatric nurse practitioner. My research experience includes clinical trials, patient registries, investigator-initiated studies. These experiences impact the medications I prescribe, the assessments I perform, and the education I provide to my families. As a principal investigator, I examined the presence of bacteria in the mouth of children with arthritis. Thanks to grant funding from Akron Children's Foundation and the DAISY Foundation, I was able to conduct this novel study. I couldn't actively participate in such research if not for the support of Akron Children's Hospital leadership, our nursing leadership, our team of talented statisticians, grant writers, research coordinators. I'm grateful to be associated with Akron Children's Hospital and the amazing team of professionals. The Nurses' Knowledge of Heart Failure Self-Care Education Principles tool was developed after discovering that nurses had many misperceptions about heart failure self-care management. After publishing our findings, I began receiving requests to use the tool. I realized it was an innovation when the request increased. So research tools such as our Nurses' Knowledge of Heart Failure Self-Care Education Principles tool was novel and valuable and continues to be relevant and valuable today.
Hi, my name is Haley Devine and I'm a fourth year BSN student at Case Western and I kind of just wanted to talk a little bit today about my innovation and how I came up with it. So it all kind of started with my experience working as a nursing assistant on Sideman 5, which is an ENT and colorectal surgical oncology floor at university hospitals. So a lot of these patients would come out of their surgeries with new tracheostomies, leaving them unable to speak. And as I worked there, I noticed a lot of communication barriers, but one avenue specifically was through the collate system. So these patients would hit their collate and it would let the secretary know that they needed something. However, they wouldn't be able to say what exactly they needed. So then the secretary would call me as the nursing assistant to go in. However, a lot of times the patient would need medication or to be suctioned, which I had to call the nurse to come in and do. And even though this caused a disruption in my workflow and the nurse's workflow, more importantly, it increased the amount of time from when the patient called out to, whenever, to when they would be able to get their needs fulfilled. And luckily I didn't experience this, but if there would ever be an emergency situation when the patient would need someone in there right away, they wouldn't be able to let the secretary know that. So it could um, increase the risk um, for something going wrong. So what I kind of came up with to combat this was a redesign of the call light that was on our unit, or um, I think it's also used across the country. So on this redesign call light, I have four different buttons. And the first one is the bathroom button. So if they needed any bathroom assistance, and then there's a nurse button. So if they needed medications to be suctioned, anything else the nurse would be able to provide. And then in the top right, there's an emergency button. So if they're, they had any airway issues, any bleeding issues, they could hit that to let them know that there's an emergency going on and it would alert the staff. And then finally, there's an other button. So if they needed the temperature readjusted, any blankets, anything else like that, they would be able to hit that button to let someone know. So from this, it kind of gives more specification to the staff and to the patient to be able to let them know what they need. And I was fortunate enough to share this innovation with um, the University Hospitals Nursing Research and Innovation Day and uh, got connected with the UH Ventures team and with Philips Healthcare. And although we found that there are similar products on the market already, I'm still working with them kind of more in a research sense to see if there are any ways that we can reduce some of these communication barriers with the patients. So from this experience, I've definitely learned a lot that I hope to bring into my future career as a nurse. I think a lot of times, not just with nursing, but in general, we can get complacent with the way we do things just because they're the way we've always done things, even if they're not the safest, the most efficient, or the best way of doing things. But I think there are a lot of gaps that still exist within healthcare and within the acute care setting that we can definitely improve upon. And as nurses, we're in with the patients, we're an integral member of the healthcare team. And I think we experience a lot of these issues firsthand. So that's why I think nursing-led research and innovation is so important because we're really able to understand how things work and the best ways to improve upon some of these systems and processes. So in conclusion, thank you so much for letting me share my experiences. And I'm excited to see what the future is gonna look like and what all the advancements we can make within healthcare with an emphasis on nursing-led research and innovation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jane Hartman. I'm an advanced practice nurse at the Children's Hospital at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm also the inventor of the Highline. As a pediatric nurse for the past 40 years, I can tell all of you that it's never too late to innovate. During my career, I've witnessed many changes in the medical landscape, except perhaps for one of the most basic patient interventions, vascular access and the resulting IV tubing lying and dragging on the floor causing the potential for IV dislodgement, tripping and falls, and infection. You've all seen patients walking through the hospital with their IV tubing either close to the floor or actually dragging on the floor. And that's because IV tubing is a standard length, whether you're two feet tall or six feet tall. As you can see in these pictures, these are some of my favorite ones that I've taken throughout my Highline adventure. And my most favorite one is this child at the farmer's market sitting on the ground with all of his IV tubing laying around in the grass. Now we all know that grass is not actually the best place for IV tubing to be lying. It bothered me that there was no solution to this common problem. About four years ago, it struck me that maybe I could create the solution to the problem. I envisioned a simple IV holder that attached to the IV pole and I elevated the tubing off the floor. That's when I opened my desk drawer and amongst the 
many things that were stuffed in there. I chose a, a metal ring, a badge holder, and a piece of twill tape, and the High Line was born. I worked with Innovations for a few years, but couldn't seem to convey my vision. They kept saying that it was not viable. But the reason why I did not give up is because every time I asked a nurse what they thought of this idea, they said, that's a great idea. That's a common problem. So hundreds of nurses cannot be wrong. So I thought, I have to find a way to refine this um, invention. That's when a 3D printer and a son that knows how to use it got me to my second prototype. We were finally speaking the same language, the language of CAD, Computer Aided Design. Who would know? Then through my interfacing with Innovations and my mentor, Nancy Albert, who also assisted with the development of the High Line, we received a $5,000 seedling grant to produce a usable prototype that we could test. As you see now, Cleveland Clinic Biomedical Engineering constructed 25 of this prototype and we were a go to start our IRB approved study when COVID hit. Once I saw the pictures coming out of the ICU of lines strewn across beds and floors and inserted into pool noodles and other stabilization devices stuck to beds and walls, I literally got up from my desk and ran to Nancy's office. I said, look at these pictures because I knew we could help. That one moment started a three month journey that has seen us collaborate with our innovations team, ThinkBox, Case Western Reserve, Cleveland Clinic Biomedical Engineering, and outside vendors to create a production ready version of the High Line. We produced thousands of samples and distributed them to Cleveland Clinic hospitals as far away as Abu Dhabi, working with frontline caregivers on impact and usability. We have applied for nine provisional patents and also a trademark for the name Highline. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Never in my lifetime could I have imagined a whirlwind such as this. What I can tell you is that there is no such thing as a small idea. Something as small as the Highline is having a significant impact on patient care. I wish I knew how to speak the language of innovations in two ways. Number one, conveying my idea. What you really need is a drawing and a small prototype to test the idea to make sure it works. I lost a lot of time at the beginning trying to convey what my idea was. Number two, now that licensing is underway, I wish I knew new contract language and all the legalese that goes along with it. Thanks very much. My name is Jonathan Segu. I serve as Vice President of Clinical Operations for University Hospitals in the Office of Clinical Transformation and for UH Ventures. I am formally trained as an acute care nurse practitioner uh, through Case West Reserve University. Uh, I currently serve as a firefighter paramedic uh, on the east side of town, Munson Township, Chardon City, uh, during my weekends. And uh, it's really my pleasure to be here today to speak with all of you. Um, thank you, Case Western Reserve University and University Hospitals for inviting me to talk to all of you today about innovation uh, during our wonderful event for Year of the Nurse. Um, so me, for me, innovation has always been a part of my career uh, from day one. When I look back at every opportunity that I've been given uh, to care for patients, my question has always been, how can we do it better? And so I think that's where innovation begins for all of us. I think back to my days at University Hospitals in the cardiothoracic and surgical ICU. I think back uh, to my first medication error as a bedside nurse and thinking and reflecting personally, how can I do better? How can I do a better job? How can I make sure <clears throat> that that didn't happen again? And I learned from it, I shared my mistake, I shared my solution, uh, hoping that I could make myself and my team better. Uh, that's really where innovation started for me and I didn't realize it because I wanted to improve things. Um, next, it went into my cardiothoracic surgery ICU days um, where I first had my initial uh, project idea for my research for my DMP uh, project. 
and it was all around cross-contamination via stethoscope and how can we um, prevent those uh, cross-contamination events from happening. We know that a sternal wound infection uh, can be uh, devastating to a cardiothoracic patient, so I was very passionate about that. As life would have it, opportunities change during your learning, and so sometimes does your research project, and that's okay. Um, I next think about innovation during my six years with critical care transport and how we were innovative in launching a helicopter and aircraft before having an accepting physician uh, for life-threatening uh, diagnoses. And uh, what was the workflow to be able to do that quickly, to be able to do that safely, to engage all team members and have better outcomes. Um, I then think about my days across the nation in the mobile in integrated healthcare space, uh, thinking about our needs match time appropriate resource allocation and how can we take uh, non-emergency calls, bring them through a proprietary algorithm and match their needs with resources, risk levels, time response windows to make sure we get the best outcome uh, for those patients. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about today um, is putting all those things together. Um, and I, I do so uh, by thinking about uh, our response from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and our response at university hospitals. So this was our greatest opportunity to innovate. It was immediately necessary overnight uh, and we needed to come up with a solid plan. And I think back to all of my experience in all those spaces to take all of that knowledge, all of those resources and put it together uh, to help congregate living facilities and their infection of COVID-19. So I'll never forget, it was a Saturday morning. I had just left the firehouse. I was actually not even home yet, um, still in uniform. And um, I was on a call with a nursing home that needed help. Uh, somewhere in town, they were one of the first outbreaks. And as I was listening to this call, I could only think about something we call in the fire service as uh, a pre-plan. So if you have a high risk structure that uh, in the event of emergency could be a disaster scene, you plan for it in advance, you put a playbook together, uh, and that's what we did, but we did it for nursing homes uh, that had an outbreak of, of COVID-19. We took them through um, keeping it out or screening at the door, their PPE strategy to prevent against cross-contamination, cohorting or their triage, uh, testing and prioritization for testing, moving patients after testing results came back, um, treating those patients in place, uh, which was really important, uh, end of life wishes, uh, which is always important for, for any patient, but particularly in this case, uh, threshold for transport to the hospital, um, and doing so with dedicated resources without activating the 911 system, and admitting folks directly to the hospital or the intensive care unit. Um, and then reopening their business. Um, at the end of all of this, everybody has to reopen uh, their hospitals, their businesses, uh, and helping think through that strategy. We put all that together in one playbook. Um, it was not necessarily new information or proprietary information, um, but it was gathering all the resources, putting it together in one spot uh, where folks could use it, uh, have it guide their day, walk the hallways with it. And um, we saw some really, really great uh, recoveries and turnarounds uh, in the community. Second question is, given my experience in developing innovative processes and products, what advice can I offer my colleagues who have ideas but no, don't know where to get started? So it's a great question. So first, uh, my advice is to work hard, uh, pay attention, learn as much as you can along the way, and take all that information with you. Uh, we just discussed the COVID-19 Intercept team um, and the playbook that we put together at University Hospitals. That was accumulation of all of my experience, talents, past experiences that I learned with other colleagues along the way, uh, that we put together in one large knowledge base uh, playbook and we built a team out of it. 
Um, two, I would say uh, don't be shy, uh, ask for help, and figure out who your innovation team is with the company you work for, uh, your health system. Uh, I trust that they do exist. Um, sometimes uh, it's hard to find them. Uh, I know we've worked really hard at UH to make sure that that's not the case, uh, making it really easy for clinicians and other team members to raise their hand uh, and come to us with ideas so that we can help you think through them, develop them. And um, there should be clinicians on the team like myself that can understand what you're thinking uh, and help you. But there's also folks that are really good at understanding the business side of it uh, the innovation strategy from inside out, outside in, and they can help you. Uh, please don't be shy. Uh, I trust that they're waiting for you and hope you come to them with great ideas about how you can make your business or your hospital better. Thank you. And a clinical nurse scientist and innovator. And from listening to this inspiration from the NINR director to hearing from innovative nurses in the field, I'm excited to moderate today's session. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists, please utilize the chat box and we have, we'll get to as many questions as we can. So Haley, I want to start with you. Starting with you, Haley, first and foremost, um, I heard of you winning an innovative competition at University Hospitals, and I want to say that I was motivated and encouraged for more innovators to be in the field, and it made me reflect back on me, and I did not introduce myself um, really, but I said that I'm an innovator, and so meaning that I love innovation, and I'm so happy to see that when it starts with students. So for you, how do you think the process of developing nurse innovation will shape your nursing career or, or will influence your nursing career? Yeah, I think this whole process has been really inspirational. I've definitely learned a lot um, through everything. I think when I start working as a nurse, I'm definitely going to be a lot more aware of different issues um, that I see working on a unit. And I think that will help me be able to kind of think of like, oh, is there any way we can do this better? Is there any research we can do to figure out this thing or, yeah, so I think it's definitely just going to help me um, be more cognizant of different issues and potential solutions. Awesome. Now I have a follow-up question really quick. Um, how do you think now that you've had that taste of innovation and you're seeing how influential you can be, do you think that you look at problems differently now in the clinical setting? I think so, for sure. Um, yeah, because I think I mentioned this in my video a lot of times um, before this whole process. I just look at things and be like, oh, like, I think this could be better. Like, this is a little inefficient. Um, this isn't as safe, but it's just, oh, like, we've always done it that way. So I think now on, I'll be looking at things and thinking of ways you can improve it instead of just accepting that that's how you always do it and all of that. Awesome. Thank you. And so moving on to you, Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was inspirational. And given that you gave advice on how nurses can get started in the field, I would like to challenge you and ask, what do you think the biggest challenges are in nursing research and innovation at the moment? And how do you think, you know, these changes, like what do you think we'll need to do in order to, um, make our future more effective as it comes to research and innovation? Like, what do you think some of the critical changes that we need to do as nurses to be more effective when we're talking about research and innovation in general? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. So um, pointing back to part of my uh, recording, um, I think back to my bedside nursing days and it's intimidating just to know where to get started. Uh, it sounds expensive. Um, I don't have the relationships with the people. I'm still trying to learn how to be a bedside nurse, but we need those nurses to uh, tell us their good ideas, expose dysfunction and opportunity, call out safety issues um, so that we can really look at uh, making this journey over to value-based care. Um, we are leaving our fee-for-service uh, world that we live in. So thinking about how we're improving quality, safety, patient experience outcomes while doing all that and decreasing costs, we need 
the wisdom of the community uh, to help us do that. And the bedside nurse is absolutely one of those folks. So um, yeah, it's up to all of us, uh, everyone represented today uh, in this uh, event to make sure that our innovation teams, offices, labs, um, venture teams, whatever they might be at your institution, uh, have an easy way for folks to raise their hand. They're warm, they're inviting. Um, and, and we've done that and uh, um, we're excited about it. So I think uh, that's the starting point. Awesome, and thank you so much for sharing that. And last but not least, um, Jane, thank you so much for sharing what I consider nursing wisdom. And I always laugh because I see nurses and they look like you and you all don't look old, but then you tell us, you'll say, oh my gosh, I got 40, 50 years in nursing or I got 30 years in nursing. And I'm like, where did it start? Did it start when you were a baby? So the questions that I have for you, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. It's like given now that you have, I would say, such a rich experience and a different take on innovation and research now that you're doing so much. If you were to go back to, let's say, um, Haley, you know, being that senior or you were to go back to that novice nurse that is touching the floor but has these innovative ideas or is going through the process of innovation. What would you do differently then if you had all of your knowledge now? Uh, <laughs> so um, thank you for uh, having me um, talk about the High Line. But as far as innovation and actually just nursing in general, I think it's really important for us to make it easy for nurses to do the right thing. Sometimes we put such barriers up that even uh, it was this was not the easiest thing even for me and I, I am a very seasoned vintage nurse and um, you have to persevere number one number one I think the most uh, important thing is that you have to be passionate about it and believe in what you're doing so if if you don't believe in it nobody else is going to believe in it so you have to really have a conviction that this is a problem this is the workaround I mean, I have been a nurse for 40 years and I've seen many, many workarounds and um, th that's actually the beginning of the innovative process is doing the workarounds like, well, I, I did it this way because it didn't work so well the other way. Well, right then and there is should be when we say, hey, stop, let's take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. Awesome. And thank you so much for sharing that. And I am looking to see if we have any questions from any pan, um, any of our audience members right now. Okay. And seeing that there is none, I have a question for you all. And it is around, I would say, the notion of nurses not seeing themselves as being innovator. And I think that, you know, all of you spoke to it a little bit. I know that when we're talking about whether it's a nurse scientist, a bedside nurse, you know, instantly when someone thinks about innovating or creating things, then they may shy away from it because they think that it doesn't go with the altruistic piece of nursing. So could you share with our audience, what your take is in regards to, when I say nurse and innovation, saying to yourself that you are a nurse leader and that it may turn into entrepreneurship or it may turn into you um, creating a product that may you know, have some sort of financial benefit. What do you say to nurses that are scared to cross over into that domain? And Jane, I see you, we can start with you. <laughs> I, I don't be afraid. <laughs> so uh, I think that we have to actually think outside the box because yes, nursing is taking care of patients and all those things, but it's also doing nursing research and being innovative and trying to make it easier for the rest of nursing. So not every nurse is going to be an innovator, um, but every nurse can be an innovator. Um, but they, I think that just making it, uh, you know, making it part of the lexicon. And nobody told me when I was in nursing school that I could invent something. 
now when I when I chat with my nurses, they'll say, oh, that, you know, they, and of course they all know about the Highline. Um, and I, I, I challenge them. So I think challenging our, our nurses to say, well, what's not right? And, you know, how do you think we could fix it? Got it. And I was going to say, so I know that Jane answered that. And so instead of having um, the other two answer it, Haley and John, I got some other questions. And so just even thinking ahead. So Haley, I see you as being, I'm, I'm looking at what I would say, like the younger nurse, the middle nurse and the seasoned nurse. Okay. And what I'm thinking in that context. So for John and Haley, when we're thinking about retired nurses, right? What role do you think retired nurses can play in supporting nurse and innovation? So there are wealth of knowledge. They may be retired, but how do you think that they can usher other nurses along on the nurse and innovation journey? John? Okay, I'll go first. Um, so, um, you know, the, the average age of, of the bedside nurse is going up and, and there's a nursing shortage. You look at the age of the educator, um, it's higher um, and the shortage is more concerning. So uh, I think a really way, amazing way to give back and, and close out the final chapter of the fourth quarter of your career is to teach, um, whether that be uh, clinically at the bedside like I have, if you want to enter the uh, more academic setting uh, and, and, and teach. Um, but what a great way to end your, your, your nursing career. Um, I did want to add um, to just a little bit to the previous question, if I could please, because I, I feared that as I was watching the videos, I didn't read the directions uh, completely. Um, but I want to tell the folks watching this that uh, innovation is just not always about um, widgets, gizmos, gadgets, and things that really make sense and make life easier. It could be about people or process or tech. Um, and so you need to think about those things. I'm, I'm more of an operator than an inventor, but I'm still an innovator. So um, that was really important uh, during our COVID timelines. Um, so um, we, we do have a, a team that helps us think through those things. Um, we do have Brittany Merkel on our team who has um, service design education specialty. Um, so there's a whole process of thinking about how, how you do that innovation. So just wanted to add that, thank you. Awesome. And so Haley, so I'm going to divert again to another question instead of having you answer that. So my question for you is, is given that an innovative mindset is important in nursing, we talk about workarounds, as Jane alluded to, my question for you is, is for education, should nursing innovation be included early on um, in nursing education? And if it should, just putting you on a spot, what are some ideas that you think could be helpful for nursing education programs and making sure that they're fostering this in students? Yeah, I definitely think that's a very important part um, going forward too, especially with like the increase in technology and all of that stuff um, is nursing innovation. And I would love to see that um, integrated into uh, like universities and different nursing programs. Um, just coming off the top of my head, I think it would be cool if there would be different classes or different programs within classes that you introduce problems that exist within the bedside nursing um, community and then work with your peers and work with different faculty members to kind of come up with solutions for those issues. So kind of just practicing and modeling what it would look like to um, participate in nursing innovation and research. Awesome. So I just want to thank everyone so much. And I'm actually going to bring back on our Dean for Nursing Research at Case Western Reserve University, Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing, to wrap things up. But I just want to say thank you so much for joining our panel. We are very grateful for you all and are excited to see what you are going to do. And to our audience, I'm very excited to see what you'll do as well. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Carpenter. I'm the Interim Chief Nurse Executive at University Hospitals. We are proud to have partnered with Case Western Reserve University's Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing to bring you today's program. 
One point as we wrap up is a reminder that all participants will receive an evaluation after the program, and we look forward to your feedback. Once the evaluation is completed, you'll receive a certificate of completion via email. In closing, I just extend my sincere thanks to our keynote speaker, Dr. Zank, and our panel of nurse innovators. A special thank you goes to Case Western Reserve University and the Year of the Nurse Steering Committee for their tremendous effort and their planning that brought this event together. I'm confident that each of us takes away points of inspiration to thrive in our own journeys as nurse innovators and researchers. Together, we will improve the system of healthcare and the well-being of our communities. Thank you for joining us this afternoon.